Good morning and happy new year from Quimby and Bethsaida United Methodist Churches. I'm Pastor True Luck and we're coming to you this morning from Quimby where the service is already underway. Uh, I want to do something that I've done a, a few times, not much lately, but I am this morning. Uh, Lou and I got up today thinking about uh, of course, the song that we sing a lot, Because He Lives, and uh, got out to Beth Slater and B. Ann was playing it out there, and Curly and uh, Suzanne sang it, so before I preach this morning, I'd like for us to do that, that chorus. Y'all stand, sing out, sing out now. You know, one of our friends who watch it on Facebook, YouTube, don't only hear me. <laughs> because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he Fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Thank you, y'all did good. You may be seated. Today I want to say goodbye to last year with all of its many challenges and heartbreaks. But I also want to remember the good times and, and the good things and the blessings of last year. Uh, I want to remember the one especially who was with us through it all. Always has been, always will be. Promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. And we've had some times last year when we really, really maybe depended on him even more than usual to get us through some very difficult times. You know, in my family, we lost one of our own, lost my son-in-law Jeff to complications from COVID and we don't understand why these things happen. But you know, we were also blessed last year by the arrival of a pretty little blue-eyed girl named Scarlett. So you know, we, we, it, it went both ways for us and things don't always work out, but God is always God. And that's what we need to remember. Uh, we also lost loved ones from our extended family. Joe here, about another son-in-law, lost a brother. Uh, lost several members from uh, our church, not all the COVID, but between the two churches, quite a few members last year. Uh, we lost C.G. Welch, who you all heard used to come and play the guitar for Miss Floyd to sing. He was married to one of Luke's first cousins, and you all have your own list, so uh, that's the kind of things we dealt with last year. The good news is, and the thing that I like to remember for all of those that left us that were saved, and most of the ones I've got on my mind today, probably all the ones that I've had on my mind today, I can say we're saved. We get to see them again in eternity. So until then, we've got work to, to do here. And I appreciate you all and your faithfulness so much. Learned a long time ago that God works in mysterious ways. And we have losses in our lives and things that we can't ever explain. But God is still God. And so uh, one of the scriptures I keep coming back to, one of my favorite, is all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. So, if you listen to that, my responsibility today is to love God and to be sure that I'm doing what he called on me to do. And I thought about that and I said, how can I say that even simpler? And this is what I came up with. I'm supposed to be a loving, obedient child. You know what I'm supposed to be? A loving, obedient child. Loving him and just doing what he expects me to do. All of us have challenges and have had challenges over the course of the past two years. 
People react to things different ways. Many people are not reacting to these things and responding to them the way that they should. And I don't understand that, you know. Uh, we've gone through tough times, and I just told you the thing that got me through is remembering I'm supposed to be a loving, obedient child, and yet we've got a whole world out there who's going in the opposite direction. They seem to be turning their back on God at the time when we actually need Him most of all. You know, I struggle like most of our family with the loss of Jeff, but two things that brought me through that is the scripture, all things work together for good. I may not know what the good is yet, but I trust God. And the other thing is, I know without a doubt he was saved. He made a point of letting me know that with the text message he sent me from the hospital just before going on the bed. So I take courage and encouragement from that. But the whole world is not like that. Uh, they're turning their back on the church. Tracy, my daughter Tracy here, came across some statistics here about a week ago and was kind enough to call me and share them with me. And I want to share some of them with you today. Now, we don't like to give out a lot of statistics because I don't want to put you to sleep. But listen to these. This is from uh, an organization called the Pew Research Center that's been around, been doing this for whole lot of years. About 30% of American adults say they do not have a religious affiliation. 30% of American adults do not have a religious affiliation. Said so this is 6% higher than five years ago and 10% higher than 10 years ago. We're going in the wrong direction. In 2007, 16% of American adults identified themselves as atheists or agnostics or nothing in particular. Think about that. 16%. 14 years later, here in 2021, that 16% has gone up to 29% who have uh, uh, called themselves atheists or agnostics or really nothing at all. Currently, 40% of American adults are Protestants. There was a 4% drop over the last five years in Protestants. There was a 10% drop over the last 10 years. Now, I had the statistics on the uh, Catholics also, and I, I don't, I'm not offending anybody. Uh, I just wanted to focus on what we're doing here, but I will share this with you. The Catholic numbers did not drop like the Protestant numbers. The Catholic numbers held pretty, pretty steady, so that's good for them. The survey also, and this is really disturbing, the survey also asked those responding how often they pray and how important they consider religion to be in their lives. How often do they pray and how, often, and how important do they consider religion is in their lives? 45% of the American adult population pray on a daily basis compared with 58% in 2007. So that's going down. 32% of American adults say they rarely or never pray, and that's up from 18% in 2007. So from 18% to 32%, rarely or never pray. And there's some other statistics that trace this symptom, but I think that's enough to make my point this morning. Now, Satan has his liberal agenda. He has his liberal agenda, and it's attacking us at every level. Beginning with the family, it's attacking us in our churches, it's attacking us in our communities and our liberal schools. You know what liberal schools lead to? Liberal adults and liberal leaders. Now before somebody gets offended, I'm not talking politics there. My point this morning with liberal is how do you view the Bible? Do you take it as it's written, or do you leave out the parts you don't like, or do you change it to suit your purposes? People who do that are liberal. I don't care what political party they belong to. And because of these things, you know what we've experienced? No prayer in schools anymore. Almost full-term abortions the right to choose which sex you want to be, and I've just recently found out, Lou and I have, that there's something new out where you can change your choice every day. You get up, 
what sex you're going to be today. I don't want to be crude, but God made us different. Male and female, he made us. If you stand in front of a mirror in the morning, I don't think there's any question about which one you should be. No restrictions on what businesses can operate on Sunday. Y'all remember when we were young and growing up, that very few places were open on Sunday. The bars weren't open. You couldn't go out and buy alcohol and all that stuff. And the list goes on. All of these, by the way, have come out and have changed. Guess what? During our lifetime. During our lifetime. Our generation allowed this to happen. And it's just continuing to get worse. So, you know, I can't possibly cover all these different areas in one sermon. My wife said y'all wouldn't stay and listen to all of it. Even Miss Lloyd says that if it's that long, I'd divide it up over two or three sermons. <laughs> so I, 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 I cut back. My emphasis today is really going to be on the family and on the church. And I'm going to be brief on those, but I do want to make the point. Uh, the thought here, and this is what I want you to take home with you today, is that I can make a difference. That you can make a difference. You fill that in with, with I for yourself. We can make a difference. We can make a difference. Uh, something that I've been reading and studying and uh, really spoke to me, and it, it's about that too, and I'm going to share this with you. And it's about making a difference. It says you do not need a stage or a crowd or a mission field to make a difference. Don't need to have everything in our life all together. We don't have to have a million dollars in the bank or a magnetic personality that just draws everybody to you. We don't have to have all those things. Such so Christians can understand the power, of their, just underestimate the power of our influence. We underestimate the power of our influence. You come into contact with many people every day. Think about it. You got the people up here at the IGA when you go in there. You got people that you work with. You got family and friends. Everywhere we go, we come in contact with people. It says each encounter you have with someone has the potential to have a positive impact on that life. Each and every one that we come in contact with we have an opportunity possibly to impact that life in a very positive way. To many people, you may be the only Bible that they will ever read and the only God they will ever see. Think about that. The only Bible they will ever read is what they learn from you about the way you live your life. And they aren't being sacrilegious here when they say that you may be the only God. It means that people can see God in us and the way that we live and the way that we react and the way that we treat others. There are people you can reach, acquaintances, friends, co-workers, whoever, and the greatest that the greatest preacher in the world would ever reach. I heard recently that uh, many people believe that Billy Graham had a greater impact worldwide on Christianity than any other man that's ever lived. That's a powerful statement. You can agree or, uh, or not. I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. But you know, there were people that I can reach, that you can reach, that he may not have been able to reach. There are people out there that God's going to put in front of us because we relate to them in some way, or they know us, or there's something special about the meeting that makes them open to hear the message at this point in time. So we never know when it's going to be that opportunity when we're with somebody to make a difference in their lives. The Bible puts it this way, and this is from Matthew 10, 5 and 6, and uh, this is from the message. Now you all know I don't preach from that Bible. I preach from my NIV. But a case, it, it makes something really, really clear, and I want to use that this morning for this. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic attacking some public enemy. 
Go to the lost, the confused people right here in your neighborhood. Start right here where we are. Right here where we are. It says your encounter doesn't have to invoke a grand gesture or sharing some profound truth. We don't have to come up with something new. It's not preaching them a sermon. Most people, if you corner them and you start preaching to them, they get bored and they go walk off from you. You know what it suggests? A warm smile, a kind word, a listening ear, asking somebody how are you today and actually being interested in their answer. I mean, I was asked people just as a matter of habit, how are you? Without really getting tuned in on their answer. We're guilty of that sometimes. And we can make a powerful dis difference in somebody's life with just simple things like that. You know, whatever your small act of kindness may be, whether it's buying someone's meal or a cup of coffee or taking time to simply ask them that question, just takes a few minutes. You know, it's showing them the, the love that God has for us and what we learn from God's Word about relationships. St. Augustine put it this way. Preach the gospel each and every day, and when necessary, use words. I like that. Preach it every day. In other words, it's just the way we live and what people see, see about us. And then when necessary, use words. Share it with them. It says, however, when the situation calls for it, be bold in your faith. There are times when we need to be bold. There are times when we need to speak out. It says, if you see someone in pain, ask them, and I like this, ask them if you can pray for them. If you ever notice, most of the time, whether somebody is a believer or not, if they're in trouble or they're hurting or they're struggling with something, if you ask them if you can pray with them, almost every time they're going to say yes. Almost every time they're going to say yes. See, we have the cure for every suffering and solution to every problem. And it can be summed up in one word, one name, Jesus. That's what people need to hear from us. So we need to be good ambassadors for Christ. We're representing him. We need to be good ambassadors for him. We need to be sure that people see Jesus in us and through us, just in the way we live our lives. That it's, we're always the same person, you know. And you can, they can count on that. And we especially need to create an environment in our homes. Think about this. We need to create an environment in our homes for people, our family, people coming in, learn to love each other, learn to forgive each other no matter what, and a place where people pray together. Those are things that ought to be in our homes just because of who we are. I think for at least my two churches with the ages that we have in here in these two churches, most of us can relate to what I'm talking about here because most of us probably grew up in homes like that where we actually came together, you know, and ate around the table together. Where he took the children and put them to bed at night and had the nighttime prayers with them there. Same thing back and you think, well, those were silly little prayers, but now, you know, I hear my great grands praying the same kind. Mama would stand by the bed and I'd go through all the list of all the family and then I'd start on all the pets the dogs, the goats, the squirrels, the rabbits, nothing got left out. But that's where we learn to pray, a lot of people. So it starts in the home. So this is the best place to teach our young ones. And so we're talking about making a difference in the world. That would be my first point is in the home. And then the next one is to go to church together every Sunday. Need to go to church together every Sunday. It's not happening too much anymore. One of the things that uh, I think is parents ought to make it a requirement, not an option. I still hear some parents, and this is going to offend somebody. I don't intend to offend anybody. But I still hear parents say, well, they're old enough now, I'll just let them decide for themselves. God forgive us. I've been young before, and I can tell you as I look back, I'm glad Daddy didn't let me just decide everything for myself. If he had, I might not be with you today. 
Bible says for Satan not to gather you yourselves together. Families need to come and, and worship together. And uh, so that would be the next thing. Don't just send them and put them out the door. Go to church with them. Many have lost the desire to go to church. Isn't that a shame? Many have lost the desire to go to church. Others have just gotten out of the habit. COVID-19 has affected so many things. Given a lot of people excuses. One of the things that the common question you hear now, I, as a pastor, I may hear it a little more than you, but probably not as much more. When you sit down and talk with somebody, you talk to them long enough, they'll say, What's happening in your church? Has your people come back yet? Y'all heard that? Have your people come back yet? And unfortunately for so many, the answer is no, they have it all come back. They have it all come back. Some of you who have been here all the time record, remember some of the conversations we had when we started considering recording our services. And of course, those first few months, we weren't having service at all. So we had to do something. And so I, gave into your request and we started sending it out. But you might recall one of my concerns was people go get in the habit of listening to it on, on YouTube and Facebook and not come back. And we've had a few who have done that. And it's happening to churches all over. I know because I, I hear the, the pastor saying about it. So, you know, we can't let those kind of things happen. Uh, I know I got a lot to compete with. I hear it, sitting around at home in your pajamas, sipping coffee. And all I have to offer you is the word. I told my best same day, and I'll repeat it here. I had talked to my administrative counsel about it, but as long as you're fully covered, if you want to come in your pajamas and sit in the back corner over here somewhere and sip coffee, if I got to do that to get you to church, I say go for it. I say go for it. But you need to be in church. You need to be in church, especially now. Especially now. The other thing is we can't grow spiritually when we isolate. We grow spiritually by being with each other and helping each other, and sharing in each other's concerns, like this, sharing these prayer requests, you know, and sharing praises later in the service. That makes us a family, a family of God. And, and we all grow together. We... Uh, you know, we mourn with each other when we lose loved ones. We celebrate with each other when we have good things happen. So, in closing, I want to say that Christians, churches, time we took our country back. It's time we took our country back. It's the United States of America. It's time we, we took it back. We can't do it ourselves, but with God, who can stop us? With God, who can stop us? If the church will be the church and do what the Bible tells us we're supposed to do, do what most of us learned growing up, the devil doesn't have anything to fight that with. I'm closing with a scripture. You won't be a bit surprised. I used it a lot this last year. And I may start using it again in the new year. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. I bet you got it memorized now. But remember, if my people, who are his people, the church, we're his people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then, see, there's an order of things, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. That's what we need. And just be sure nobody misunderstands. I realize that the church is not just meeting in a building. I realize the church is made up of Christians all over this world who are born again Christians. That's the church. But in the context of that, we ought to be worshiping together in a church. That was my point I've been trying to make. So here, when he, when this scripture here is for all the born again believers, if my people, anybody who's, who's a Christian, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. If we're a Christian and we believe that, why wouldn't we want to come together in the church 
environment. So God said it. I believe it. Let's stop sitting around complaining about all the things that are wrong in the world. I'm guilty of some of that like you all. Let's stop just sitting around. That word just is important in this sentence. Let's stop just sitting around and complaining about all the things that are wrong in the world. Let's make a difference one person at a time. Let's make a difference one person at a time. Beginning where? In our homes with our families. Getting active in our churches. Letting that spread out into the communities. <coughs> Walking with God through all of it. And we'll just be amazed what could take place. We'll be amazed at what can take place. Even starting from a small place like Quimby, South Carolina. Or Effingham, South Carolina. How do I know this will work? Because the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? God is for us, who can be against us? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For those of you who are watching on YouTube or Facebook, we really appreciate you all tuning in every week. Uh, if you have a church home, we would encourage you to be in your church home. But if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come worship with us, either here at Quimby or out at Bethsaida. We would welcome you either place. But the main thing is, is, is uh, be in church. And uh, for our people who can't be here, just always remember that Lou and I love you. We miss you when you are here, and we're praying for you. So until next time, may God bless you all. <laughs>